Listen in on this week's Scientific American 60 Second Science Podcasts. I'm podcast editor Steve Mursky. Einstein wrote, striving for social justice is the most valuable thing to do in life. Tom Frieden, director of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention from 2009 to earlier this year. Frieden addressed the graduating class of the Albert Einstein College of Medicine here in New York City, May 23, 2017. Scientific rigor and social conscience don't always go together. Some individuals and some institutions may lack one, the other, or both. But together, they are a remarkably powerful combination. And we need them both because we face some real threats. We face threats from nature, whether it's the next Ebola or Zika or SARS or pandemic influenza or HIV, it is just a few mutations away. We face threats, frankly, from killer industries, tobacco and other substance, unhealthy and addictive substances. And we face threats from policymakers who may deny quality medical care and prevention to millions of people in this country and around the world. We are also faced with the threat that America could retreat from or undermine our role in the world. Einstein wrote that nationalism is an infantile disease. It is the measles of mankind. I'm confident that with your commitment to caring for patients, to advancing knowledge, to social justice, you will help prevent and stop the spread of that infantile disease. Every single one of us has that responsibility. For Scientific American's 60 Second Science, I'm Steve Mursky. Fitness bands like the Apple Watch and the Fitbit aim to track your vitals, like heart rate. But early models weren't all that accurate. We thought of them a little bit like random number generators. They really didn't seem to be providing anything that bore any relationship to heart rate. Ewan Ashley, a cardiologist who studies wearables at Stanford University. He and his colleagues have now tested seven newer fitness bands from brands like Apple, Fitbit, and others. And he says those heart rate stats have gotten way better. Yeah, we were pleasantly surprised, actually, by how good the accuracy of the heart rate monitoring was. For most of the devices, the air rate was less than 5%. That's good enough for your doctor. But where all the devices failed to measure up was estimating calories burned. Even the most accurate devices were off by 27% compared to lab measurements of energy expenditure. One device was off by more than 90%. If you think about going to the gym and working out for an hour and maybe that's around 400 calories, then in reality that could be anything from 200 to 800. And, and that's a big difference if you're thinking about somebody who's incorporating those estimates into their lifestyle and in particular thinking about what to eat that evening based on the workout they did that afternoon. The results are in the Journal of Personalized Medicine. The reason for the discrepancy, Ashley says, could be that we all burn energy at different rates, and that's hard to reckon from simple input stats like weight and height. Some people are incredibly efficient and look incredibly elegant when they run, and, and others really clearly look like they're burning a lot more calories to cover the same amount of ground. So if you own a wearable, it's probably safe to trust the heart data. But what it can't tell you is whether your time on the treadmill really justifies that chocolate shake. For Scientific American's 60 Second Science, I'm Christopher Intagliata. When California was strangled by drought, the city of Los Angeles was offering homeowners cash to replace their lawns with landscaping that was less thirsty. Because water just evaporates from overwatered lawns. But how much? So that turned out to be a lot of water. Diane Pataki, an ecologist at the University of Utah. Turns out to be 70 billion gallons of water a year. Pataki and her team got that number using a combination of real-world sensor data and modeling. And they found that of water wasted specifically in urban landscaping, lawns were to blame for three quarters of it, with LA's six million trees accounting for the rest. The study also uncovered something these ecologists were not expecting to study, economic disparity. The amount of vegetation is really closely related to affluence. And so in LA, that means that wealthy neighborhoods actually have twice the evapotranspiration of poor neighborhoods. Meaning low-income neighborhoods not only miss out on the greenery, but also the natural built-in cooling effect of evapotranspiration. The findings are in the journal Water Resources Research. 
Finally, if you think native trees are the solution to water waste, think again, Pataki says. Some of the highest water users in L.A. are those species, including the native California sycamore, which is a very, very popular tree. The reason being that Southern California doesn't have a lot of native trees, except alongside rivers, meaning they're water guzzlers by nature. Better, she says, to plant other species that thrive in Mediterranean climates, like water-thrifty pines and palms. Because even if the drought comes back, she says, L.A.'s secret to staying green may be its trees. It doesn't take a lot of water in terms of absolute gallons to keep them alive. So moving forward, L.A. could be very water efficient and maintain a very extensive tree canopy, which I think is good news. For Scientific American's 60 Second Science, I'm Christopher Intagliata. What comes to mind when you think of Alaska? Probably snow and ice and extreme cold. But what about tomatoes? In fact, agriculture is booming in the 49th state. Because in the last seven years, nearly 700 giant greenhouses have popped up there, thanks to a program funded by the U.S. Department of Agriculture's Natural Resource Conservation Service. One greenhouse just outside Homer, an area better known for its halibut fishing, includes a tunnel packed with plants that produce fruits and vegetables that you'd expect to find on a dinner table closer to Mexico. Look at all those tomatoes back there. This is like the salsa tunnel. It is. It is. Come, come walk inside for a minute. Okay. Farmer Donna Ray Faulkner. She guides me through rows of wall-to-wall and floor-to-ceiling greenery. It's... Yeah, this is the nightshades. So all things nightshade, eggplants and peppers and tomatoes and tomatillos. And that's her husband, Don McNamara. With help from the sun, the inside of the tunnel becomes a region with what's called a good hardiness zone, a standard the USDA uses to describe places where certain plants grow best, meaning that Alaskan farmers can grow everything from corn to melons. Such tunnels are reliably warm, and they help extend the growing season so that even in January, when the sun's only up for about five hours along Alaska's southern coast, Donna Ray Faulkner can still farm. Yeah, some of the Asian greens and kales and things like that can keep going through the winter. Um, we often do covers within covers. So in addition to the high tunnel, which has a double layer of plastic, we might have, for instance, another low tunnel over those things in the wintertime to give them that extra added protection. Community greenhouses have even popped up above the Arctic Circle in Alaska's northernmost village, Barrow. That means Barrow residents can now farm for 11 months out of the year. But still not in January, because that far north, the sun never rises in January. For Scientific American 60 Second Science, I'm Emily Schwenk. Caviar is one of the world's priciest foods. It can cost thousands of dollars a pound. And caviar from the beluga sturgeon is the most exclusive of all. But even the experts have a hard time telling the eggs from two different species apart by appearance alone. So scientists came up with a method that's more than meets the eye, a genetic test that identifies variations in nuclear DNA that are unique to the beluga and its cousin, the sterlet. The test can differentiate row of those two species from that of eight other species of sturgeon. Best part, given caviar's premium price, the test requires just a single egg. The study's in the journal Scientific Reports. The researchers say that by definitively identifying the real stuff, the test could prop up its high price. But the effort's not just of interest to the one percenters. Genetic verification could also be used for conservation. Belugas are critically endangered. And since they hybridize with other sturgeon species, conservationists need to make sure that farm-raised fish they plan to reintroduce into the wild are the real thing, and not just a cheap lookalike. For Scientific American's 60 Second Science, I'm Christopher Intagliata. I wish to tell the United States, France believes in you. The world believes in you. New French President Emmanuel Macron speaking in English June 1st after American President Donald Trump announced that the U.S. would withdraw from the 2015 Paris Climate Agreement. I know that you are a great nation. I know your history, our common history. To all scientists, engineers, entrepreneurs, responsible citizens who were disappointed by the decision of the President of the United States, I want to say that 
they will find in France a second homeland. I call on them, come and work here with us, to work together on concrete solutions for our climate, our environment. That might sound like a good deal to all kinds of American researchers and foreign scientists currently working in the U.S. in light of massive, looming Trump budget cuts at the National Institutes of Health, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the Food and Drug Administration, the National Science Foundation, NASA, the Department of Energy, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, the U.S. Geological Survey, and, of course, the Environmental Protection Agency. I can assure you, France will not give up the fight. I reaffirm clearly that the Paris Agreement remains irreversible and will be implemented, not just by France, but by all the other nations. I call on you to remain confident. We will succeed. Because we are fully committed. Because wherever we live, whoever we are, we all share the same responsibility. Make our planet great again. Thank you. For Scientific American's 60 Second Science, I'm Steve Mursky.